Great. So everyone, this is Adam Shaw. He's the head of demand generation at IntentWise, but he's been in marketing for a while. Now he'll be able to give you a lot more about his background. He also works with a lot of really interesting startups in the NFT space. Um, him and I were geeking out about marketing before this call officially started. I know he's going to have a ton of really great info to share. So thanks again, Adam, for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, so like you said, my name is Adam Shaw, head of demand channel IntentWise. Uh, IntentWise is a e-commerce platform for um, sellers and agencies to up their analytics game as well as their ad optimization um, needs on the Amazon platform. Uh, I've been in marketing for about seven or eight years now, starting in college, um, you know, with the, the typical kind of internships, going through, you know, pretty much the the typical. Um, marketing path, but a little bit accelerated, I think, than, you know, what usually um, happens, did a lot of jumping around. So we'll be able to give you guys some insight into, you know, that, that kind of thing as well. But, uh, you know, we can jump right in. Um, I have, a, I'll let you guys know, I have about three, three main topics that I'm going to talk about today. And in between each of them, I'm just going to pause uh, for some questions so that, you know, the questions can be super relevant in between each of them. Um, and we can all stay super engaged. Um, and I told me that you guys, Tend to have a ton of questions, and I'm super excited for that because that's the, the best part is to actually be able to sit and talk with you guys and not uh, you know, just talk at you about some information. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna really cover three things in, in um, you know the process to kind of get into the marketing space and making a career change. I think a lot of these are uh, applicable across different careers, uh, career moves, but I will discuss some specific marketing things as well. Um, First section I'm going to talk about is, you know, setting yourself up for success. You know, what do you do even before you get um, that resume out there, before interviewing, uh, before even, you know, choosing the job that you want to take uh, after getting an offer? Um, step two, we're going to talk about finding the right role once you're ready to really go out there and start marketing yourself. And then number three, um, I'm going to talk about the interview process uh, and ways that you can really kind of master it and, and use that to your advantage um, in the process. So, it's going to jump right in. Um, so setting yourself up for success. The first thing I always tell folks when they're trying to get in the marketing space, especially from the career chain standpoint, is um, you know setting expectations for yourself. Uh, about two years ago, I hired somebody who uh, was making a move from the food service industry into marketing. Um, now she had been marketing in like the early '90s for a couple of seconds, like basically just an entry level job, and then she decided to go back into food service. She ended up becoming a sommelier. Um, and she basically was in the same situation that many people maybe on this call are where they don't have a ton of applicable, immediately applicable marketing skills to just go in and get a new job. So I asked her, I said, you know, what was the toughest part of your process? She said setting expectations for herself. Um, something I have to realize is that most people hiring marketing uh, folks aren't going to want to hire you. And the, 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 really the, the crux of the issue is, is that there are a lot of people who just won't hire people who are on a second career. Um, but those are not the people you want to work for anyway. The ones that do are going to see your value immediately. And if they don't even look at your resume and, or maybe they talk to you and you can tell the reason they don't aren't very interested is because maybe you're on a second career and you're not somebody coming right out of college. I wouldn't consider that a loss, right? That's a positive working for that person was probably not going to be a great fit um, for you. So really make sure you're setting expectations for yourself and understand that the vast majority of people aren't going to want to hire somebody in a second career. The people who do are going to be super attentive to you and understanding your value a lot better than anybody else is going to be understood. Um, so that's super important. And with that, you know, think using that going into kind of the resumes part, um, be super true to yourself on your resume. And this rings true throughout the entire um, process. Be exactly who you are. You don't want to sell yourself as somebody else and then have to conform to being that person to be successful in your job. Um, good hiring managers know, you know, when they see a good person that they like. So I always tell people in my interviews, it's like, you know, let's just, let's just have a chat. So that's kind of what your resume is. It's kind of the pre-chat. Tell people exactly who you are you know, highlight that this is your second career, highlight that you're excited about bringing in, you know, something new to the marketing space, right? You guys have something to offer that 99% of the applicants don't. And that's something that's a different career, uh, early career path. Um, so what kind of information do people want to see on resumes from that kind of, you know, that shift or that early part of the career? And um, one part that's a little bit kind of 
a more of a depends section is the certifications, right? Do you go out there and get your Google certification and your Facebook certification? Um, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, but the second thing that, you know, people like me and other hiring managers are looking for, for those mid-level and entry-level marketing roles are planning skills, which I know educators have incredible planning skills. And if I were to see an educator come across my desk as a potential candidate, that's the first thing that I'd want to look at is, all right, how do they create a plan? Because realistically, I know that if I'm hiring somebody in an entry-level role, their technical expertise is going to be pretty minimal. Um, we're going to train them on that, right? We know that that's, that's not a problem. I want to see once I train you on the skill set that I, that I'm going to get you trained on, how are you going to apply that in a planning sense? That's incredibly important, especially for somebody like me, who's like not a great planner. And I know who I have to lean on. Um, I love to see people have incredible backgrounds in planning. Um, another thing that I love to see is leadership initiatives. So I'll go back to the same example of the lady who, who worked for me, who was originally a Somalia. Um, she was the head of like of her Somalia group in, in a, a pretty big city in, on the East coast. And I saw that, I was like, that's really cool. She takes initiative to go out there, get people together, you know, and, and figure out pretty cool stuff. Now she was doing more, much more interesting stuff, I think, because she was getting people together to drink wine and talk about wine. Um, but I immediately saw that in her when we started working together. And I saw it even in the, res in the, in the resume and in the interview um, that she really likes to take a group of people, get them together, figure stuff out and apply it. Um, and I think that that's something again, that educators have that you, know, you guys have to get together with people of various ages, various skill sets, you know, set an initiative to get them on the right track and then apply that. Um, I think that's super important. So to go back to the certifications point, it's super important. Um, focusing on executional items for certifications is, is key. So there's a cup, there's all sorts of different certifications you can get out there, strategic certifications, kind of a little bit more, you know, 10,000 foot view certifications. Those aren't particularly important, especially when I'm looking at, um, more entry-level marketers or people making a career change. The reason being is that, um, strategic wins change so fast in marketing um especially in our our industry like now when i first got in marketing even just eight years ago um we were you know facebook programmatic tv radio we barely even had connected tv where we nobody was paying anything i was doing connected tv now we got tiktok instagram reels facebook connected tv we have with all the walled gardens for e-commerce now you've got amazon you've got walmart you've got target um so the strategic wins kind of shift really, really fast. So when I see somebody had all these strategic kind of certifications, I'm like, all right, that's interesting, but can they actually execute on that? So the kind of executional things that I look for are, did you get all the basic Google certs? Um, you are going to be miles ahead of somebody else who doesn't have them. Um, I know that's going to take me, if you get all your growth certs ahead of time and your LinkedIn certifications and your Facebook certifications, I know that immediately is going to give you an extra two weeks probably on a competition when you are, you know, onboarding. Um, some other areas to look at, again, going back to the planning piece is, uh, you know, any project management software like Asana and ClickUp. Um, those are the two really big ones right now in marketing. And I'm always struggling and a lot of marketers I talk to, are, I'm always struggling to find people who are sufficient in those when they walk in. Um, again, like, I always train people up on it, but that's a spot where if you can just be perfect, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in a different section, but if you are a perfect in the project management tools that are provided, you are going to be able to learn fast on other people and people are going to lean on you to get stuff done, which is really, really important that people feel that you, you know, they can lean on you. So when I see that in a resume that like I'm um, click up certified, Asana certified, I'm like, wow, that person's going to be able to come in and potentially make a huge difference because as much as like agencies and marketing organizations want to think that their show that they have everything all planned out, you know, you could have a hundred people and have like one, maybe one person who's even good at the project management tool. Um, so think about that. You might be even the only person on the team who has a really sufficient understanding of it. Um, you know, and that can put you really ahead of the, ahead of the group. Um, the last piece of setting yourself up for success is a question that a lot of people kind of come to at some point, depending upon how long they've been in the job search and how successful it is, is, do you need a recruiter? Um, the answer is, especially for uh, early level roles, entry level roles, is probably. Uh, three days ago, 
or maybe it was a little bit further. I put out a entry level marketing job. I think it was just marketing coordinator. I got a thousand resumes in 20 minutes. I took it off. And I didn't look at any of them. I just put them on. I, I made a, I made a rule on my Gmail to make sure anything else that came in went directly to the trash. I was like this, I literally can't do it like this. So I immediately reached out to a recruiter and now I'm talking to my network about it. Um, so the answer is probably unless you are super high profile in a very specific network that, you know, you know, that somebody is going to potentially come to you or when you post, Hey guys, just a reminder, I'm looking for a marketing job. You know, somebody might very quickly come to you and say, Hey, I've got this. Or if you're part of this network here, right. And Anna, you know, she's on the call. She's going to have the job description in front of her, you know, later today or tomorrow, you know, she, you know, can help people find those roles as well, or just being part of a network, right. Is really important that. So yeah, recruiter is a big question. And also I'm sure many of you know this, or if you've been in the same job, if any recruiter asks you for money, that's not a recruiter. So I don't, don't use them. Um, you, you may know that, but I've, I've gotten a couple of people who have gotten hit by that before, especially when they're this first time they've worked with one. So, um, so any questions about the setting yourself up for success? If we want to open that up for a few minutes. Yeah. Well, I did just want to say, I'm glad you brought up the them not asking you for money because I've seen some people, um, in my Facebook group I have here seeing like, I'm working with a recruiter. It only costs me this much money. I'm like, that is not a recruiter. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give for finding a recruiter? Yeah. So find somebody, find a recruiter that's specific, right? So just a marketing recruiter, um, they're kind of a dime a dozen. Uh, so lo like a local recruiter is really good, right? A two or three man shop is awesome. Um, don't go to Robert Half unless you're looking for like some, you know, gig work for lack of a better phrase. Um, they're just not, they aren't there to place you to a, to a long-term position. It's just not really what they do. Um, creative Circle is a really good national one, but outside of Creative Circle, I've gotten the most success going to recruiters who are like really locally known or a super small niche, right? Like, so for me, I go to a, a couple of recruiters now that specifically work with B2B um, demand generation people, right? So really specific niche um, and most of them, and I have another one who's really specifically B2B tech demand generation marketers, right? So I know when I go to him, he's gonna bring me people who are super specific, know their stuff. Um, and on top of the fact that he was, he recruited me once to a role. So I know that he sets me up or sets up the, you know, the folks that he's saying to me to succeed. Um, because I, I firmly believe that the recruiter needs to be there, not just to place you because that's how they make their money. They need to really, really have an investment in you succeeding and, and getting you ready, like for that job. Cause I've, I've hired a lot of people who are really bad at interviewing and the main difference really could be a good recruiter just so that the person doesn't feel surprised when they get into an interview. Yeah. And then someone also asked you those marketing certifications, I know you're mm -hmm. talking about Google, LinkedIn, and Facebook, but could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about the specifics of what they are? Yeah. Yeah. So Google has, well, they have a ton. So I would highly recommend getting your Google search and uh, campaign, uh, Google search and the Google DSP, I think they call it now. I forget what they call it. I haven't gotten it in a long time. Um, and then Google Analytics is, is huge. Being a Google Analytics power user is awesome. Um, I did leave out HubSpot, which is kind of silly because that's like the most in-demand one right now. Um, like hiring what we call, at least in my side of the industry, a rev ops um, role or a, a marketing ops role. Those people are are really in high demand right now. And if you can just get a ton of the HubSpot certifications, you're going to be in really good shape. Um, like I said, watch out for the strategic ones. Just early in your career, those don't really matter a lot. And HubSpot has really good strategic ones, um, but they won't really do a ton on your resume, um, at least for most hiring managers. And then uh, LinkedIn has two. Um, one is strategic focus and the other is implementation focus. That is a strategic one I would actually take because it does lean a little bit closer to um, the technical application as well. And then Facebook is one that I kind of put a caveat on. Facebook makes you re-up it every year, I think it is now. And it's like 150 bucks. And unless you are specifically, unless you specifically know that you really want a job doing just Facebook ads, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. It's expensive and it's a huge pain in the butt. You have to like download the proctoring stuff on your computer, face a camera around the whole nine yards. So unless you're like dead set on being a Facebook media buyer, which if it was nine months ago, I'd say go for it. Um, nowadays, probably not so much. Yeah. And I guess this is, you know, another, this leads into another question is 
how, if you're not super familiar with the digital marketing space, how do you even go about like figuring out like, am I interested in Facebook ads or what type of marketing you want to be doing? Yeah. So what I would do is I would start by just doing stuff. And I, I say that it's super broad, but I would start by just going on LinkedIn or whatever, or TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, whatever places that you like to create content and create content there and just see what you enjoy doing. And then start to learn and understand which platforms do best with that kind of content, right? So if you love like really business focused, like I don't want to say super serious, but, but definitely more like, you know, I guess more fine tuned stuff, you know, LinkedIn might be your space. If you are really funny and love like doing like kind of cool stuff, like TikTok might be your place or Reels or Instagram, right? Um, create content, see where you like to do it the most. And then, you know, dig your heels in there. I always tell people like find somewhere to hang your hat on, right? Like years ago, we used to have marketing generalists. Like we don't have those anymore. I'm literally like, I'm about ready to write a job description for a super specific um, content creator. I'm really going to hire somebody to create content for us on TikTok and Reels. This is an entry level role. I'm just going to find somebody who did it really well in college has like, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand, you know, 20,000 followers, something like that, because I'll say, okay, that person knows how to do it. I'm just going to hire them. They're going to do it all for us. Right. So just get, understand what you like, get really good at it and hang your hat on it. Yeah. I definitely like up, upvote there. I've hired teachers that are really great at Instagram, for example, and then brought them into ed tech companies to like run our Instagram, right. And our reels. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Someone else had a question looking at, um, if most companies are looking for college grads and I get this question a lot too, but marketing is a really popular major. Um, mm -hmm. And so what value would educators have competing against recent marketing grads? Uh, I have no idea what any of my employees degrees are in. Uh, I really couldn't even tell you. I just know they went to college. Um, usually what I'll use the college as like a, like the, the college education as just like, can you commit to something for some lengthy period of time? Right. Like that's nice to see, but even now I don't, I just kind of make sure that this, the, the person is a focused individual who can kind of get stuff done. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have a political science degree. It's a completely useless degree. So, um, you know, but like I wouldn't have enjoyed getting a marketing degree in college. I wouldn't have liked marketing. Um, so if you love marketing and you really just want to get that degree, like it's certainly not going to hurt you. Yeah. That, yeah. The, I don't know what any of my team does either. So, uh, or did in, um, <laughs> yeah. did in college. So before we move on, are there any other questions anyone has? And you can also feel free to hop on um, via voice, but if not, we'll move on to the next section. Yeah, Lori, I really appreciate that question too, because I want like just getting, and I'll, I'll dig into this a little bit later, but don't feel like a job is like, you're not going to get a job just because you don't match like a certain thing on the on the job description especially the the education part because again like the people that you actually want to be your hiring managers and want to be your supervisors aren't the type of people who would really be super concerned about that if they're gonna be nitpicky there they're gonna be kind of they might be a little bit of a pain in the butt to <laughs> to work for so yeah awesome well let's go to the next section then cool so yeah want to talk about finding the right role so that kind of plays into exactly what i was just saying was um, well, in here, we'll talk a little bit about reading the job description and really like focusing on like what you can glean from it, understanding, is it going to be a good job? Is the environment like most important? Is the workplace going to be like a really good environment for you? Um, and that answer is going to be different. And like, I'm going to give you some of my green, yellow and red uh, kind of flags on those, but they might be completely different for you. Like, I don't like to have a super, super structured work environment. Some people really, really like that. Right. So for me, seeing something like that might be red flag, but so we'll get into that. So first of all, I want to go through the types of marketing, um, right? There's so many like different crazy types of marketing out there that people are talking about right now. Um, so I'm going to just look at 10,000 foot view, business to business, business to consumer and direct to consumer are the three that I really like to highlight because they kind of have somewhat distinctive skill sets um, across the three of them. And within B2B, um, which is where I've, I focus my energy these days. Um, there's kind of two pieces, enterprise versus startup. Um, enterprise marketing um, is really focusing on reaching those Fortune 500, very, very large companies. Like think of a product like Salesforce. The people who are marketing for Salesforce are enterprise marketers. Um, so think of, it's, it's usually going to be a, a little bit more of a strict piece. You know, you're... Um, 
this is important everywhere, but your marketing automation team is probably going to have a really, really big play in what's going on here. Your sales team is oftentimes going to be dictating a lot of the marketing team goals. Um, that happens a lot. That's good and bad. It depends on who the sales leaders are. Um, and then the startup, you know, kind of marketing is a little bit different. It's very much focused on, you know, very quick conversion rate optimization type things, a little bit more um, just kind of gorilla in your face marketing, like, hey, here's a really good product. Buy right now. It's going to make things happen for you guys. You know, they are trying to, these are people who, who can make a decision like this, right? An enterprise can't make a decision fast. It's, it's structurally built that way on purpose. Um, so these are types of people where, yeah, you, you probably aren't going to get that 500K a year deal out of them, um, but you're going to get high volume, two to 1,000 to 10,000, $20,000 a year deals. And those are the types of things that, um, you know, I work on right now. Like I get, a lot, I have a little bit of a smaller, um, you know, maybe up to a little over 100K a year is kind of our, our lower end budget um, uh, for our clients. So, and I've worked in the past where, we're selling products that were four, five, six million dollars, right? And that's a completely different space. You can do both. And I highly encourage you to try to get into a situation where you can experience both, but just be aware of those. Um, business to consumer. So a couple of things to think about there. Um, you know, are you selling a service, a product? Is it a brick and mortar business? Um, and then consumer packaged goods. All those are very fun to work on. I've worked on quite a few of them, particularly consumer packaged goods. Um, it's, you can get into all sorts of incredible stuff, you know, and, and some of the, the most coveted roles in the world in marketing are with like PNG and Unilever and places like that in that kind of B2C space, which also bleeds into our, my third type that I like to categorize as a direct to consumer, which is a lot of people think of as kind of like more like the e-commerce and retail stuff, right? It's basically, you see the ad on TV and you buy it right now, you go to the website and you buy it. Um, I was in that for quite a while and it's a lot of fun. Um, and you get to basically a crash course in what we call performance marketing which is literally any tiny little thing that you can change, just increase the conversion rate just a little bit can make huge differences, especially when you're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year in ad spend. Um, and that can be a lot of fun. So, you know, think about where you want to go. And, and of course, one thing I did leave off is, do you want to go to an in-house role or an agency role? Um, I, it tends to look like most people want to go in-house eventually, but I highly recommend getting agency experience. It's a ton of fun. Um, you will get a lot of late nights and you will feel super undervalued for your job, but the, the, uh, the, uh, the work is, is nuts and you learn a ton. Um, and you oftentimes get to really ex more so in there than anywhere else. You get to experience that whole, uh, you know, feeling of, you know, I can let people lean on me and I can lean on people because you really do need like a group to get through it. Whereas on in-house, um, it's a little bit more every man for himself. It makes sense, but not in a negative way. So really think about that. I, I tend to tell people to get an agency life. It's cool. It can vary. It. And what's awesome is that you can oftentimes jump from one type of product to another uh, very quickly. So um, that can be fun. Um, so that being said, those are kind of the three that I like to focus on um, within those I, would, I put down like three different roles that are in high demand right now. Um, and this isn't the only ones, but I can tell you it's the ones that like I'm looking for and like all my you know colleagues are looking for in different businesses is always marketing coordinator, right? Somebody who's really, really good at that planning and the project management stuff um, and wrangling together a team, like those leader init leadership initiative things. These just have people who are, you know, poised to be, you know, you know, director of marketing one day or, you know, senior senior marketing manager. Um, things like that. Um, content creators, like I said, like if you're, I'm literally starting to hire people just based on them having a good presence on social media for the type of content that I want to, that I want us to produce. And that's starting to change in the past. It used to just be like, who's really good at content. Right. Um, and they can do it across everything. It's not the case anymore. Like my head of content, um, you know, we were sitting down together today and figuring out who are we going to like, what are we looking for? Um, and, you know, it's, it's like somebody who's really good at TikTok, right? And somebody who's super comfortable being in front of a camera. Um, content creators are no longer just people who write content or film content. It's actually people who are doing the content themselves. And that, that's what's changed a lot, like in-house, basically talent that makes sense for, for those kinds of things. Um, great way to get into that. Um, make great content and then start charging people money for it. Um, you know, I've heard, I haven't tried this and I don't know anybody who has, but I've been reading a lot more about people literally getting like a following of like five or 6,000 people doing a video of a product you really like, and then just like sending it to the 
to them on Instagram and being like, Hey, I made this video, 5,000 followers. If you want me to post it, I can 500 bucks, you know, like give it a try, right? The worst thing that's going to happen. Someone's going to say no. And you know, you're back to the same place you were the day before. Right. So it's not really a big problem. So that's kind of a cool way to get into that. Um, honestly, I think if somebody were to, with a, a ton of followers dropped like a really nice piece of content in my TikTok inbox or Instagram inbox and said, Hey, I'd love to work for you guys. This is the kind of content I'd produce. I'd probably go for it right now. So uh, I know a lot of people who would, um, and then of course, project manager, uh, a little bit more specific. And if you want to get really into it, you can get a project manager or a project management, um, certification, which is actually pretty in depth, you know, multi-month thousand something dollar course, but as it is really valuable. Um, so, you know, the project management tools, like I said, are all the rage right now. So knowing how to use them is a huge plus. You don't have to have like a full blown project management certification, um, to get that kind of job, but, um, to, to go up in that ladder, you will eventually need to get it. But oftentimes, you know, your company will probably pay for that. Then the last piece in, um, you know, find the right role is reading a job description. Um, super important. And the first thing I tell everybody is 30% rule. And even that might be too big. If you fit 30% of the job description and you like it apply, right? Um, I write job descriptions and I don't expect anybody to fill all the pieces on there. Um, I just want to get people who think that they will either want to learn about it or they know how to work with people who are doing that um, type of thing. So here are a couple of green lights in a job description for me. Um, when I see that further education budget is, high, is, is, uh, is touted in the, in the job description, that's huge. Um, something that's kind of small, but I think speaks, uh, huge about the, the employer is meeting free Fridays, right? We're starting to implement that intent wise. And I want my team to be able to actually get stuff done. Right. Especially on a Friday, right? Nobody wants to be in a meeting at four 30 in the afternoon on a Friday. That's prime margarita time. And I don't want any of my team to feel like they can't just log off at 4.45 or 4.30 if they wrapped up for the day, right? Um, employee first model. So a lot of people say this, and I think that when you actually um, get an interview, you have to ask what they mean by that because some people just kind of write that on, the, on the, uh, the job description. But what it really means is we, we, we hire really, really good people and then figure out how to make them successful. And that's kind of what I do, right? So when I go and I'm looking for a head of content. So when I hired my head of content, I said, all right, I'm going to go out and find some really good people and whatever they're good at, that's what we're going to hang our hat on. Right. My head of content's an incredible writer. So we're hanging our hat, our hat on some really good written content right now. Um, and if, if I went with somebody else and my head of content was incredible at, you know, video, um, you know, we would hang our hat on that. That's probably a bad example. Cause you're also hanging our hat on video, but like, or TikTok, like we would have, we would have been all over that. If my head of content was a TikTok nut, um, so that's employee first, hiring good people and giving them the tools to be really good at what they like. Mental health benefits. I always look for this um, because I just think it shows like, look, they are, they're not just saying things, they're not just doing, you know, meaning free Fridays or employee first model, which is kind of an abstract thing. They're literally investing cash into making sure that you are in a good spot to succeed. That's super important. Um, yellow lights to me. This is funny um, because super popular these days, unlimited PTO. Um, I call it kind of a yellow light because it's also like, I've been to some, I've seen some places, I haven't actually worked in a place like this, but I've seen somewhere it's like, okay, unlimited PTO, but nobody takes it because they're nervous to take it all the time because they almost get like shunned for taking it. Um, you know, so kind of watch out for that. Really ask about what that unlimited PTO means you know, ask how many days of PTO people take on average. That's super helpful. Um, growth oriented is a super red, yellow light um, for me in a job description because that literally means nothing. Um, every single company is growth oriented. So to me, I'm going to like further kind of scrutinize the job description and say, okay, are they throwing in any other filler words that just don't mean anything? Um, loosely defined roles. If the role that they want you to fill is super loosely defined, watch out for that. Um, because they may not have a good like training program for you or just don't understand even what they're hiring for on the total on the opposite end of that. It could be a positive because like I do, I just want to hire really good people and then give them the support they need to succeed in the areas that they like. So sometimes like my job descriptions are a little bit loosely defined, but that they come more loosely defined based on the seniority level. So my entry level job descriptions are certainly going to be much more focused. Um, and my senior level ones, just like, you know, I don't hold my, my senior level employees hands. Um, but sometimes, you know, I would for my angel people because I expect to do that because I want to help them learn and, and be better.
Um, I know y'all like hear that people miss a lot is financial backing. Um, watch out for, or at least ask questions about VC backed companies um, because it can end up being very stressful if you're being you know, pressured by an overbearing board of, you know, directors or something like that. So just watch out for that. Ask, you know, people in the interview what that means and how much, um, you know, input the board has in day-to-day -day activities. And then red lights, um, fast paced. If I read fast paced in a, in a job description, that basically just means that you'll be working from five to nine. Um, and if you're not, you're not going to work there for very long because they will push you out. Um, I have not seen a job description fast pace um, that has not meant that when talking to people who know who, who work in them. So I, I very much stay away from those. Um, and if the job description is like extremely deliverables focused, like you will be delivering 30 leads a month, you know, or, you know, X amount of clicks a month or something, you know, watch out for that. Um, you know, deliverables change. And, you know, if they're just going to be focusing on getting something out of you, they, it'll just be like, you know, squeezing an orange, right? Just trying to get the juice you can. And then eventually, you know, that orange will be squeezed and they're going to fire you or you'll, you'll burn out. And they don't really care. Um, so the biggest thing I look for in job descriptions for me, just kind of summing this all up is, am I going to face burnout in this job? And if I am, is there a support system there for me to fix that? And if I don't feel like that's the case, I want to apply. So that's kind of at that second second piece, finding the right role. Any questions um, about you know how to look for the good roles in marketing? Yeah, I had some direct questions come in, so I'll ask, but mm -hmm. uh, keep sending them in too as you guys think of them. But mm -hmm. I I really appreciate the focus on burnout because I think that that's what a lot of the teachers on this call can empathize with right now. I mm -hmm. see some nods. Um, and so one of the things you mentioned that I actually don't think will be super familiar to people is that term of like unlimited PTO. So like what mm -hmm. that like ex exactly means. Yeah. And that's why I say watch out for it is because sometimes it doesn't exactly mean anything. Um, and you can be pressured not to take it. All right. So if there is actually on top of the fact that if there is actually PTO days in your contract, you don't take them and you get fired, then you get paid out. So, and if it's unlimited PTO, you don't have any, you don't get paid out on any PTO days. So, yeah, think about yeah. that too, from a purely financial standpoint. Um, also, yeah, with the burnout thing, you know, it's, I, I super empathize with that because, you know, you guys, if you burn out, it, educators burn out, you're not, you're letting down, like, for lack of a better, like, you're letting down kids, right? And like, if you burn out in marketing, you're letting down shareholders. So like, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, I mean, it is a big deal, but like, you need to be able to like, be comfortable walking away. And you guys are faced with a much more enormous pressure. I think I'm faced with or anybody in marketing is to be faced with because you're, you know, you're responsible to children um, who are looking up to you to, to, you know, help make their lives better in the future. Uh, so yeah, think about that. Yeah. Shareholders everywhere right now are fuming at that, but yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Marketers um, and, and employees do better if you don't burn them out, if there's a shareholder on here. <laughs> yeah. um, someone asked too for you to define what you meant with um, in-house versus agency. I think that that's something oh, yeah. that's not super familiar. Of course. Yeah. So in-house being you are on a marketing team working for a brand in a brand. So you are employed by JCPenney or you're employed by Spotify, right? Or something like that. Then agency, meaning you're working for an agency and you're going to be working on you know, depending upon the, the account and your, your senior level, you could be working on multiple accounts. Great. And then someone else asked this question, Stacy, um, for content creators, do you need to have the content created on a personal account or a business account or both? I mean, I do, I, I would say just personal account, you know, do what you like to do, build it up, see what you like, then go. If it's a personal account, um, you can take a lot more risk. Cause like, you know, what's going to happen you know, lose some followers, right? <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Sorry, that's my, my great day. It's being extremely dramatic. Um, also, I was wondering oh, yeah. how you would recommend finding a recruiter. So you said to stay away from like certain mm -hmm. types of recruiters or ones that ask for money, but how would you recommend finding one that's a good fit for you in your job search? Michelle, but yeah, so I think, um, so one, I would actually tell everybody, like, go check out Creative Circle. They are national, but they do a really, really good job. So, um, but locally, you know, for, for some of your local folks, uh, I think you just really got to get into the, into that community more. So on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, wherever you guys are, 
uh, you know, find people who, who are getting out of, you know, follow recruiters on LinkedIn, get involved in their comment section. If you like them, reach out to them, even if they aren't in your niche and they'll know some in your niche, I guarantee you. So, um, you know, there's so many really good recruiters on LinkedIn to follow, um, follow them, get involved, ask them for help. Another question came in from Amanda about what are some typical, and I think this is great, entry-level marketing position titles. Yeah, so marketing coordinator is great. Um, anything with associate in it, but watch out if you see something, if be really, oh, that's one thing I should have said too. Entry-level marketing, be really careful you're not getting in a sales role by accident. There's a lot of really smarmy recruiters and hiring managers out there who will get you and you'll know, suddenly be selling cut code knives um, going door to door. So watch out for that. Um, but yeah, marketing coordinator, um, uh, marketing associate, marketing analyst. If you're in an, if especially in an agency, marketing analyst is like a really big term. Um, it sounds super data focused, but um, it might be, it might not be. It's a very broad term. So really anything with a coordinator, associate, or analyst in it next to a marketing word is usually going to be a good one to look out for. Um, and then um, we have another question. Um, someone says they have an SEO certification from ClickMinded and are working on a blog. Is it possible to get a mid-level job after one year with results? Um, yeah, sure. I think it's, I think it has to be very specific results from a very, in a very specific niche. Um, the reason being that a mid-level job if you're not, if you never worked with anybody else, and it's just your own blog and you're making a couple thousand bucks a month. Like that's amazing. But you've never, if you, if you haven't worked with a team or anything, um, I think it'd have to be a super specific niche. And I'd really, really need somebody in a mid-level role who has the hands-on and experience of making a blog. Uh, I think if you have the opportunity to even like bring on an intern or something and say that, like, I let it, let a, an intern or just even an entry level person on my team to build out my blog, to bring it from, you know, $3,000 a month in ad revenue to 6,000. I would hire you as a mid level, like um, literally immediately. Like that's, that would be a pretty cool, um, achievement. Yeah. And definitely put those results in your resume too. I mean that mm -hmm. like yeah. having data on your resume in any capacity, that's the hill I'll die on, but super important. Agree. um, mm -hmm. Marnie's wondering for marketing coordinator, is this the same as project management and is it possible to get a coordinator job without direct marketing experience? To answer your first question, a marketing coordinator can be very project manager focused, um, but a project manager job will 100% be a project manager. Um, so just check out the the job description. Project, marketing coordinator is kind of a catch all, um, to be honest with you, um, for a lot of people. So you know, just look at the job description is what exactly your deliverables might be on the role. You know, get a little bit of a better idea. Like, am I just going to be managing projects all day, or am I actually going to be involved in strategic thinking or implementation? Um, second part, um, is it possible to get a job with that? Yeah. I mean, it's literally an entry level job. Um, I expect to, to train you as a hiring manager at an entry level job, even if you have a four-year degree in marketing, um, again, because in marketing degrees, it's usually a very strategic focus and that changes so fast. Um, so yes, definitely can, um, again, highlighting those like planning skills is huge. Um, a couple certifications, you know, can really put you ahead. Great. I think that's all the questions for this section. Is there anything okay. else? If not, we have another section we can get to. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So last section, um, interviewing. So I have, I'd say, in fact, the a pretty good, uh, I think Marnie had an extra question there. Why do all the entry level jobs? So that's that 30% rule, right? Like just meet 30% of the uh, resume and you're probably in good shape. Um, I mean, my marketing coordinator job descriptions have zero to two years on them. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I've never done that in a job description. I never will. So <laughs> uh, I think people, I, I think like to me, like some people might consider an internship, right? So a year of experience. I don't know. I mean, I would, I consider that a year of experience. So maybe that's what they're looking for. I'm not sure. I would make that super clear on job description though. Like I want you to have internship experience or something like that. So thank you for that question. That is actually <laughs> kind of a funny one though. Um, yeah. So anything else? Any more follow on there? Cool. I think we're awesome. good. Yeah. Awesome. So interviewing, um, I always like to ask a question after an interview or maybe in the middle of the interview, depending upon how it's going is, 
who's interviewing who. Um, basically saying, is it super resume focused or is it person and company focused? So I wouldn't say that resume focus is bad, even though I literally have it written on my piece of paper here, resume focus bad. But I would say that it's like, it can be a little bit of a, of a yellow flag, right? And that this person is just interested in, okay, what can this um, candidate output ASAP? You know, the resume says I can do X, Y, and Z, great, hired. That's, you might get stuck in kind of one of those situations that you might see burnout because if they're just focused on getting as much out of you as possibly can um, right off the bat. Uh, on the other hand, you know, very person and company focused. Like I said, how I like to interview is I like to find really good people and then give them the support to do well in the areas that they're good at or that they like. Um, you know, so think about that. And then on the who's interview, interviewing who, how much time do they spend talking about the company themselves, right? Um, you know, I I was interviewed for intent wise by the CEO. I think I believe the first forty five minutes of conversation was all about how awesome it would be to work at at intent wise, and I was like that that's really cool that they really spent the time. Um, you know, he really spent the time to talk to me about, you know, this is who we are. We really think that we're the best place to work. And then, you know, let's talk about you type of thing. So that was a really good, con it's conversational, right? It feels good. It feels like you just got done talking to somebody that's a friend. Um, and that's exactly what I try to do. I'm really, I originally thought I was really bad at interviewing. It turns out that I just like talking to people <laughs> or talking with people better, um, more than just like asking them questions and, you know, shoot, shoot, shoot. I usually go in an interview, uh, ready to ask two or three questions to the candidate. And, but most of my interviews, if they're good ones, end up being 90 minutes long and I forget those three questions by the end of them. So, uh, trust the process. Um, if you guys, any of you follow me on LinkedIn, you probably see me type out trust the process by like 50 times a day, but, um, in the interview process, you know, especially if it's a larger company, they've optimized that process to get the best information out of you, hopefully to get the best information to you and get the best results for everybody. So if it's a really big corporation, is there a process? If it's super loosely defined, um, that could be bad. But on the other hand, if it's a smaller company and it's a more loosely defined process, it can be good. It means that, you know, we're going to tailor this process to you. I do that. I, I try to focus on, I get that first conversation, getting to know the person and, you know, do does this person, you know, meet a lot of things, but I need to just know a little bit more, or am I really ready to, ready to hire this person after a 90 minute conversation, right? I adjust this, you know, based on, you know, who the person is, or do I feel like, you know what, I really think you should talk to somebody else on the team too, because I think they're going to have some input that's going to help you make a decision. Um, because my thought process on interviews is when I offer this person money, are they, are they going to say yes? And so if I can tailor the experience to them, I think that they're going to get a lot more information that's going to help them make a good decision, which I hope the good decision would be to join a, like the, my team. So a uh, little bit of a, a kind of, you know, back and forth with the, with the level of process. And then finally, the, the most important thing, one to ask about compensation. Um, uh, if it's with a recruiter, obviously it's like immediate, like they know very quick. If it's the first time I was just talking to anybody there, it's a, it's a first interview. I ask at the end of the first meeting. Um, and I always phrase it like this way. What is your budget for this role? I don't want to waste anybody's time if we're not in the same range. Um, and they're, they'll, a lot of them will appreciate that. And if they don't, you didn't want to work there anyway. So, um, you know, that's, that's a great time to ask the question. Make sure you get that out of the way. As much as everybody, you know, hopefully loves their job and enjoys what they do, um, you got to put the stake on the table too, so. And one of the questions I get a lot, and I'd be curious to get your feedback on it, is how long should an interview process take, like end to end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for entry level roles, it should like like short. It should be pretty pretty short, one maybe two. Um, mm -hmm. Corporations might be a little bit longer because they may have like their requirements that you talk for fifteen minutes with HR, then you talk with you know the person who would potentially be your direct supervisor, and then you talk with like the the group head or whatever it might be. Um, but you know, like for me, if I'm going to hire a C-level person, it might be a longer situation. You know, an interview that these days for me is for my role in like a leadership role can last a couple of weeks with three or four hours, if not five hours of conversation, but it's just because, and it, but it doesn't feel bad. Right. That's, I think it's when it feels too long, it's too long. Like if you get done with the fourth interview for your entry level role and they say, okay, one more, we're going to give you a project. I think it's time to like turn it, you know, <laughs> maybe move on from that role. 
Yeah. And how do you follow up with people through the interview process? If you're Mm -hmm. looking, I know like a lot of, um, people are worried about getting ghosted during the interview Mm -hmm. process, right? Like what's the right cadence to follow up and check in? Yeah. So, you know, I, whenever you feel like comfortable doing it, right. So like I said earlier, don't pretend to be somebody who you aren't just to get a job. So if you're somebody who, if you're super excited and you loved it and if 10 minutes later, you're like, Oh man, I got to email them and tell them how, how much of a great conversation I had. I just, I really love talking about, you know, the Facebook strategy, tell them that say, Hey, super excited to be talking to you guys. I really love talking about the Facebook strategy. Um, you know, I didn't think about it this way until we talked about it X, Y, and Z. You know, I love getting emails like that. I think it's pretty cool. Um, it just kind of continues that conversational tone. Um, if you're not like that and you want to spend, you know, if you want to wait a couple of days, that's fine too. Um, I don't expect to get anything from someone. Um, I just, you know, it is fun when you get to continue having that conversation. Yeah. Um, okay. Heather asked a question. Um, how do you show, and this is a direct one to me, but she wants to know, and I like it. How do you show you are a really good person in an interview or even in a resume and cover letter. And I think that like sincerity is really hard to come through. Like, mm-hmm. how do you show that? Uh, I don't know if maybe it's just like really easy for me to just be myself, but um, just kind of, again, like if you feel like it's not who you are to write a super, super buttoned up resume, don't like, if you want your resume to be a little bit more fun, do it um, because you don't want to work for Like hopefully that interviewer, is facilitating this, right? And that, that's kind of on the interviewer, especially early in your career. If you don't feel like you can be yourself in an interview, it's like not, it's probably not your fault. Um, if it keeps happening over and over again, maybe like you need to do some exercises to learn how to kind of loosen yourself up. Um, but I guess to get back to the question was, um, you know, how do you be more authentic, I guess, in the interview process? And yeah, I think you, I think it's practice, honestly. That might, it, for some people, it's super hard. Some people, it's super easy. It was very hard for me, like, you know, early on, I decided to like interview a lot. And eventually I was like, you know what? I don't want to be at a company who doesn't like exactly who I am. So. (laughs) Yeah. And I was going to say, like, I read through a lot of educators, cover letters and resumes and they're Mm -hmm. like, sometimes like so formal because that's what they saw on Google. Right. And I think it's, yeah, like be yourself. And if that buttoned up, isn't who you are, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and then, oh, I should have said that too. Entry level jobs. I actually very little jobs. I don't read cover letters. So I don't know how pro like how prominent that is, um, in the marketing space, but I just skipped to the, actually, I should have seen what school you went to. Cause I want to make sure you didn't go to Louisville and then I'll read your resume, your resume. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up yeah. on the resume? So so I feel like, and I don't know if anyone else is feeling this, but we get a lot of like conflicting advice on the resume as far as mm-hmm. it has to go through the ATS scanner. So I find myself really, I'm a very outgoing, kind of sarcastic, funny person, but I'm not, I, there was no space to show that on that resume because it has to go through the robots mm-hmm. first before it gets to a person. So maybe you can talk mm-hmm. about how to balance that. Yeah. So if you are, if you have a very, like, if you're, I don't know, like, if you're a unique person, I don't know, if you have like a, a person that's really hard to, to write, um, you will do really well with a recruiter, right? When I get something from a recruiter, they tell me, hey, here's a resume. Also, this person has a really great sense of humor. They're trying to find a work where they're going to be awesome part of your team because I know that your team is, is very, you know, fun and like we're kind of a little bit more, I guess, a little less structured. So, um, you might benefit from, from working with a recruiter, um, because I would get that information. Uh, you know, it is hard to portray that in a resume and I just don't see how you could, I guess you could write a cover letter, but again, so many people like, I know, I just don't read cover letters anymore. So I don't know if, if I'd, if I'd get that, <laughs> I don't know. You're part of a comedy club. You could add that onto your resume. And I would say too, with the ATS, cause I get this question a lot. I think there are a lot. So what is an ATS? I don't even know. That applicant is. tracking system, right? So when you like upload your okay. resume from oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, it, it, <laughs> and, and that's what I was going to say. I think it's a lot less common than people realize. Like as I'm mm-hmm. like when I've led marketing teams, I post the jobs. I'm the one who gets the resumes, right? Or HR posts it, but they send them all through to us to review. Mm-hmm. So usually a human 
is looking at the resume. Like mm -hmm. I, I think the ATS plays a lot less of, I, I wouldn't write for an ATS. Like we had a, um, a career coach come on a couple of weeks ago and that was her big message was like, don't worry about the ATS. You're going to spend forever mm -hmm. trying to please something that people don't really use. But yeah, I, I'd imagine that's like a fortune 500 thing. Right. So yeah. I, like, I, I, like I said, I didn't even know what it was. Um, I guess I just called it the algorithm. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Marty asked a good question. That's really a follow-up on those resumes. How did you choose which resumes you looked at when you um, were reviewing jobs? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, of course it depends on the role, um, for entry level job. I actually legitimately do look at what college you went to because I really love college sports. So like that probably biases. Yeah. I should probably stop doing that, but um, yeah, I, I try to focus on the intangibles in the resume. So again, leadership stuff you did clubs you were a part of um, again, this is for entry level specifically uh, you know, if, especially if you're at a second um, going to second role, I want to see like, if you have gone through that whole, career path and up to what point see how like okay i can talk to this person and say hey you know your career trajectory and marketing is going to look like x y and z very similar very distant what you've already done and here's how we can do it for you and, and help you out um so that's really important and then marty i think you ask is there a place where you can find internships um yeah i mean i think most places post internships just like they post jobs these days so check that out um it's a, one thing that's just really difficult right now is getting your resume through to people, which is like, I told you that story earlier is how I literally had to turn off my, the, the LinkedIn application for entry level roles, because I think there's a lot of bots that, that apply to it too. I think that, that's probably 99% of it. So I can't really even see the 1% of people that I, I, I want to talk to. Um, so finding an internship might be tough. Um, that's probably something to use your personal and professional network for. Um, if you got, if you have a brother that works in a tech company, or if you have an uncle who works in, you know, a consumer packaged goods company, they probably have, and they're big companies, they probably have internships to some degree. Yeah, I was going to say, I think networking is really great for that. Um, I know a transitioning teacher who just secured an internship at a marketing agency just through mm -hmm. reaching out and asking if they had any opportunities and it's paying yeah, you, yeah. which it should be. But um, someone else was wondering, when you get a resume, do you look at the LinkedIn account? Always, but it, it never hurts anybody. Um, it can only help, uh, at least for me. Uh, so I really love when I have people on the team who, who want to post about you know, their professional lives and stuff like that, because I think it's super cool. Um, but not having it doesn't hurt, if that makes sense. Like I only want people to do that stuff if they want to. Um, you know, it might give me more insight. So what it could do is it could potentially, you know, shorten the super boring part of the interview where I just try to, where we're just trying to figure out super basics about each other, because I might be able to learn some more stuff about you on your LinkedIn. I can skip the first 10 minutes of the interview. Um, you know, that might have an effect on it, but yeah, I always look at people's like in accounts. I think it's super interesting to, to know more about their journey and people seem to be a little bit more willing to give up more information on LinkedIn. So, um, yes, I do. I muted myself. What other questions do y'all have? Anything else? I definitely want to open up the door to non-specific yeah. you know, questions with five minutes left. If you have any other questions about marketing in general, um, questions about Kentucky basketball, you know, whatever. <laughs> I have a, um, a piggyback question on the um, cover letter thing, because like you said that you don't look at them for entry level jobs, um, but mm -hmm. other places ask for a cover letter. So if, it, if we are asked for a cover letter, we should still create one. Yeah. I mean, if it's a, if it's a prerequisite to, to apply to the job, yes. Um, it's a, you have no choice, right? So yeah, definitely do it and do a good job at it. Um, you know, I don't know. I just don't really see, I don't get a lot out of them. I never have. I never have not interviewed somebody because of their cover letter. And I have never purposefully interviewed somebody because of their cover letter. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Any other marketing questions? Ooh, um, someone asked where they should get the certification. So you go directly through the companies like Google, yeah. Facebook, LinkedIn, right? And make sure it really is specifically those companies because there are a lot of other certifications certifications out there. They're fine, but like, yeah, make sure when you the URL is like Google Learning or whatever it is, you know, dot com or you know LinkedIn dot learning dot com, stuff like that, because you might get a certification that is not what you're looking for. It'll help, but it's just not exactly what you're looking for. Awesome. Any other questions? Also on the certifications note, um, I really do want to uh, say like, they are great. Like if you are an, a certification hunter and you just want to get like as many of them, like they aren't going to hurt you. They're just going to, they're going to help you. So like, but the things I was talking about are the things that I actually look for, right? It doesn't mean the other ones aren't going to help you become better at your job. That's more of a first 90 days discussion, right? Like what's actually going to help you once you're in there. Um, and a lot of those strategic ones will help you. Um, they're just not something I'm going to pay attention to on a resume and I'm not sure that a lot of hiring managers would. Yeah. And that's actually what someone just asked about edX and their certifications. I think that falls more so into the, like, they're great for you, but I, I'd be curious, but they're not necessarily what someone's looking for. Correct. Yeah. So I said it's Google edX. So if that helps you with that. Um, so yeah, it might help. And I'm and like, talk about that in your resume, like for sure, to, or not your resume in your uh, interview. Be like, hey, look, I have all these technical certifications, but I also have spent a ton of time on edX, just you know, or on various other areas, just really trying to tune in my skills. Like, I think that I could certainly hit the ground running because of this. Like, that's a really cool thing. I'd like to hear that. That I would enjoy hearing that in an interview. Awesome. And then someone just said, obviously, you've listed several. What would you say the two most important ones are? Because we know our, the teachers on here are busy. Yeah. So the first, I'll give you a super like broad answer, which is the two that you think you're going to enjoy the most. And then the other two are HubSpot, uh, number one, for sure. And then one of the executional like media buying, potentially the media buying one. So Facebook, Google, LinkedIn is, I think if you're getting a LinkedIn one right now, you're in really good shape because uh, people are starting to spend a lot of money on LinkedIn. That makes sense. I was about really big because it can set you up for marketing operations or revenue operations job. Um, and like somebody like me, like I can basically efficiently get through HubSpot, but like, man, having a rev operation, revenue operations or marketing operations person on the team is like amazing, especially in a startup environment and, uh, you know, really sales focused, you know, B2B environment for sure. Yes. Great. Well, we're just about at time. I'll give it another couple seconds for questions if anyone has them, but if not, I'll let y'all, I'll let y'all go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming. I, I learned a lot too. I really enjoyed this, Adam. Thank you. Yes. William Shaw, who's my dad. Um, Kentucky's going to win up nine with two minutes ago. Um, I saw him ask that question there. So uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. This was really fun. Um, please, uh, you got uh, on LinkedIn, just search me, shoot me a message. If you guys need anything, please. Um, looking forward to hearing from you guys. Good luck. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yes, the recording will be re available and sent out um, tomorrow. So y'all will all get it then too. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time and good luck everyone. Bye.